Director Christopher Nolan's blockbuster movie Oppenheimer is on the life of J. Robert Oppenheimer and the terrible moral dilemma faced by the physicist of using the ultimate weapon to end the Second World War. Robert Oppenheimer was a theoretical physicist and the director of Los Alamos Research Laboratory of the Manhattan Project, which designed and tested the world's first atom bomb. Since the end of World War II, historians and artists alike have been fascinated by Oppenheimer and documentaries, television series, books, and feature films have explored the scientist's life, work, and legacy. He is often called the father of the atomic bomb. Despite the fact that the bomb was created under Oppenheimer's stewardship at Los Alamos, whether he is truly the father of the atomic bomb is questionable. Actually, no one person can be credited with producing the world's first atomic bomb, and there are several contenders for the uncomfortable title. Among them are Albert Einstein, several other important Manhattan Project physicists such as Enrico Fermi, Edward Teller, Otto Frisch, John von Neumann, Brigadier General Leslie R. Groves, the man who oversaw the Manhattan Project, or even American President Franklin D. Roosevelt, who agreed on financing the endeavor to make the bomb. But they all pale in comparison to the contributions of physicist Leo J. Zillard. To summarize, Leo Zillard helped discover nuclear fission and conceived the idea of nuclear chain reaction in 1933 and patented the idea in 1936. He was the first person to realize that nuclear power could be used to build a bomb of terrifying proportions. In late 1939, he wrote the letter to then-American President Franklin D. Roosevelt that resulted in the formation of the Manhattan Project. Zillard was one of the real characters of the Manhattan Project since its beginning. He was one of the first two researchers to receive funding on uranium research and isotope separation. Together with Enrico Fermi, he is credited for having designed the world's first nuclear reactor and having patented it in 1944. Despite being an early leader in bomb research and having significant contribution to its development, he was the most vociferous campaigner to prevent the use and proliferation of the atomic bomb. While most of the famous scientists, J. Robert Oppenheimer, Albert Einstein and Enrico Fermi are well known for the roles they played in the Manhattan Project, Zillard remains somewhat obscure despite his contributions. This video is to fully appreciate the forgotten genius, not only his life and contributions, but his acute moral integrity that led him to denounce the very invention he had helped make. Born in Budapest in 1898 in a Jewish family, Zillard showed an aptitude for physics and mathematics. He earned a PhD in physics from the University of Berlin and collaborated with the likes of Albert Einstein and Max Planck. The hyperinflation of Weimar Germany wiped his family fortune. As a Jew, he had to resign his academic positions in Germany. Faced with the threat of the Nazi party's anti-Semitic policy and harsh treatment of Jewish academics, Zillard left Germany in 1933. It is often speculated that if physicists Leo Zillard, Lisa Meitner, and chemist Fritz Haber had stayed in Germany and worked with Werner Heisenberg, Hitler would have had the atom bomb before America. Zillard moved to London and continued his research on radioactive isotopes of different elements. Here he helped organize financial assistance for other refugees from Nazi Germany. Several of them were noted physicists who would go on to work for the Manhattan Project. He also helped set up the Academic Assistance Council to get other German Jewish scientists out of the country and persuaded the Royal Society to provide their accommodation. By the outbreak of World War II in 1939, it had helped to find places for over 2,500 refugee scholars. It is a well-known fact that Hitler banning Jewish physicists is what gave the Americans the advantage against Germany because of the exodus of brain power it caused. Prompted by the recent discovery of the neutron by James Chadwick and annoyed at Rutherford's dismissal of harnessing atomic energy, Zillard in 1933 had the sudden insight that a chain reaction might be possible. If a neutron fired at an atom releases two neutrons, each of which hits another atom, and the subsequent reaction released two more neutrons, a nuclear chain reaction would take place if there was a sufficiently large mass of pure nuclear material, releasing unimaginable amounts of energy. He was both thrilled and terrified at the prospect. An aficionado of H.G. Wells' science fiction work, Zillard realized this could be a source of energy unlike the world had ever seen but also that it could bring to life the atomic bombs. To hide its identity from German spies, Zillard took out two patents, 
a public patent with vague references to energy storage, and a secret patent, which he described as an explosive. The patent included a clear description of neutron-induced chain reactions to create explosions. To ensure its security, he patented it in the name of British Admiralty, and offered the patent to the British War Office on the condition that it remained top secret. In 1938, with the impending war in Europe, Zillard immigrated to the United States where he continued his research in nuclear chain reactions while teaching at New York's Columbia University. The discovery of nuclear fission in uranium by Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann in 1938 brought the possibility of chain reaction to the forefront. Zillard immediately saw its destructive potential and the scientific and geopolitical implications of this discovery. He conducted his own experiments at Columbia University with Nobel Prize winner Enrico Fermi and Walter Zinn, and confirmed that his hypothetical theory could indeed become a reality. The following year, he heard about a successful experiment in nuclear fission in Germany. The German Atomic Research Program, led by Werner Heisenberg, also continued to expand its own research on nuclear fission and chain reaction. This and his own research filled him with apprehension that the Nazi regime would succeed in developing a weapon first. Zillard convinced the Belgian government not to allow uranium to be exported from the Belgian Congo and fall into Nazi hands. Following the fall of Czechoslovakia, home to Europe's largest uranium reserves at the time, to Germany, Zillard decided to voice his concerns in a letter to then US President Franklin D. Roosevelt. In August 1939, Zillard and physicist Eugene Wigner wrote a letter to then-President Roosevelt of the inherent danger in Germany's pursuit of a nuclear bomb. In the letter, he informed the President that a nuclear chain reaction in a large mass of uranium was undoubtedly possible, and could lead to the construction of extremely powerful bombs of a new type. He also urged the United States to begin its own nuclear weapons program and stockpile uranium. To give his note extra gravity, he asked his friend, the celebrity scientist Albert Einstein, to sign the letter. The einstein zillard letter is considered to be the beginning of the Manhattan Project. Two months later, after looking into the matter, the US president wrote a response to Einstein, which of course was really directed at Zillard. Shortly thereafter, Roosevelt created the Federal Advisory Committee on Uranium. The committee convened with Zillard, Teller and Wigner to establish release of funds to streamline further research. Eventually, this small trickle of federal support would mushroom into the Manhattan Project, a research and development operation that would produce the first atomic bombs. Zillard continued to work with Fermi in a supporting role to experimentally verify the nuclear chain reaction. A very crucial breakthrough for conducting a sustained chain reaction was using graphite as a moderator to slow down the neutrons. However, initial tests showed that graphite absorbed neutrons. It took Zillard to realize the graphite's manufacturing process had introduced small impurities that were absorbing the neutrons rather than just slowing it down. He arranged for a purer form of graphite to be made, but more importantly, also insisted they keep the results secret. This is where the German atomic effort faltered. The Germans never did discover why their graphite wasn't working, and opted instead for substitutes like heavy water, which were too rare to be useful at that time. Controlling the chain reaction was extremely important. If the balance between produced and absorbed neutrons was not exactly right, then the chain reactions either would not proceed at all, or would lead to a devastating meltdown, even in lab environment, killing everyone. In December 1942, the duo completed the world's first nuclear reactor, which was called the Chicago Pile. With governmental support provided by President Roosevelt, and with the assistance of the National Bureau of Standards, Zillard began to procure graphite and uranium, two of the most important and valuable materials for a large-scale chain reaction experiment. Zillard would remain at the Metallurgical Laboratory in University of Chicago for the rest of the war, he would become something of a pariah out of the mainstream of Manhattan Project activities. General Leslie Groves, military head of the project, took an instant dislike to Zillard, viewing him at best as troublesome and at worst as an enemy spy. When the top-secret research laboratory in Los Alamos was created, Zillard was not invited. The scientist who started the Manhattan Project was becoming just a thorn in the side of the general in charge. Groves ran the Manhattan Project as a military operation, 
Zillard's outspoken opposition to Army's compartmentalization of information, which forbade discussions beyond one's limited responsibilities, and his sense that scientists and not bureaucrats and engineers should lead the project, ran counter to Grove's security and organizational instincts. As Zillard's research came of age, it also became militarized, and Zillard himself was increasingly cut out from the later stages of the bomb's development. Zillard hoped that the US government would not use nuclear weapons, but that the mere threat of such weapons would force Germany and Japan to surrender. He viewed the production of the atomic bomb as a necessary countermeasure to the possibility of German nuclear development and deployment. But by 1944, it was clear that Germany had no bomb, and the Allies would beat them without the deployment of atomic weapons. On May 8, 1945, Germany unconditionally surrendered to the Allies, ending World War II in Europe. The Manhattan Project had been sold to the scientists as the US's only option for defeating a nuclear-armed Nazi Germany. With Germany defeated, Zillard thought the use of the atomic bomb was no longer required. He argued that dropping the bomb without any demonstration would set off an arms race with the Soviets, and predicted that they would have their own bomb in less than five years. Zillard was correct on both. He was one of the seven signatories of the Frank Report that contended that the post-war international control of atomic power was the only way to stop the arms race. The Frank Report became the seminal document on nuclear arms control. The report predicted the impossibility of keeping the secret of nuclear genie in the bottle. Six years after he wrote his first letter that started the project, Zillard now campaigned with equal passion to persuade the American government not to use the atomic bomb against a civilian population. He organized his colleagues to press for limitations in the use of the atomic bomb. Once again, he persuaded Einstein to write a letter to President Roosevelt, but Roosevelt died of a stroke on April 12, 1945, before a connection could be made. Zillard now saw access to President Harry Truman, an aide arranged an appointment with James F. Burns, who had become Truman's Secretary of State. Zillard brought along chemist Harold Urey, pitting two scientists who had made the bomb and wanted to stop it against the politician who could not wait to use it. The two scientists left the meeting frustrated by Burns, who saw the bomb as a way to appease the Congress and intimidate the Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin. In July 1945, Zillard circulated a petition urging President Truman not to drop the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. A revised version of this petition was eventually signed by 68 scientists of the Manhattan Project, including several at Los Alamos. It was strongly opposed by General Groves and Oppenheimer on the grounds that such a petition would breach security and expose the existence of the atomic bomb. The petition did not reach the President. The Manhattan Project culminated in the testing of the first atomic bomb in Alamogordo, New Mexico, on July 16, 1945. By then, Zillard had become convinced that no good could come from actually detonating a bomb over civilian sites, and he urged the US administration to offer the Japanese a demonstration of the bombs so that they could surrender before being subjected to nuclear attack. He understood better than anyone the enormity of the devastation such a weapon could cause. Oppenheimer at that time notably failed to convey the staunch opposition felt by so many of the Manhattan Project scientists. The interim committee instead chose to use the atomic bombs on populated cities in spite of the protests of Zillard and other scientists. The Secretary of State, James F. Burns, along with Oppenheimer and other military and scientific leaders, recommended deploying the bomb immediately. Zillard's vision of a chain reaction unleashing the power of an atom 11 years earlier became a reality on August 6, 1945, when the United States dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Japan. So devastated was Zillard at his failure to avert the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he moved his research areas entirely to molecular biology, a field concerned with the origins of life rather than its destruction. After the bombings, Zillard further alienated his Manhattan Project colleagues by saying, using the weapons in Japan were one of the greatest blunders in human history. For the rest of his life, he vehemently advocated for arms reduction. He wrote widely for disarmament, and in his lectures he advocated nuclear arms control, world government, and an elite leadership role for the internal scientific community. Zillard bore the stigma of being cast as a communist due to his sympathies in his youth, 
and on the negative end of Leslie Grove's mistrust. Zillard knew a lot, and Groves had always suspected him of having Russian sympathies and now deemed him too high a security risk. There is evidence in the files that Groves was actually trying to build an espionage case against Zillard around the time Zillard was trying to circulate his petitions against the dropping of the atomic bomb. Still, Groves kept Zillard on the payroll to keep him close. Probably the reason why Zillard was still part of the project was because the army was determined to obtain Zillard's patent rights by any means, and his counsel often provided to be valuable to other scientists like Fermi and Teller. At the end of the war, Zillard was abruptly dismissed from the Manhattan Project by its military head, General Groves. In the post-war years, Zillard found it impossible to obtain work on any scientific project that involved nuclear physics. Groves reportedly did everything he could to ensure that the physicist received no position on the various post-war atomic commissions. After the war, Zillard sought to work on peaceful uses of atomic energy at the new Argonne National Laboratory, but was denied a position, largely due to the ongoing influence of Groves. Leo Zillard would ultimately become an early fellow at the Salk Institute, where he would spend the rest of his life studying biophysics. As often happens with history, the narrative is often rearranged and fits neatly with the interests and preoccupations of the victor who writes it. In the years immediately following the war, public opinion about the use of the atomic bomb hadn't yet solidified. Rather, it seemed like the tide of public opinion was also beginning to turn. Fearing that they were losing the battle for the history books, Truman government and other officials sprang into action, compelling former Secretary of War Henry Stimson to defend the use of the bomb in a Harper's Magazine article published in February 1947. The story introduced the argument, repeated often since, that the development of the bomb was a difficult decision, but it was necessary, and it saved perhaps a million American lives. The first major Hollywood film about the bomb, The Beginning or the End, debuted the month after Stimson's article. After script approvals and retakes ordered by Groves and Truman, it turned it into a pro-bomb celebration. Oppenheimer, Groves, and the Truman government were heralded as war heroes. Ironically, later in the 1950s, Oppenheimer's outspoken warnings against hydrogen bomb and risk of nuclear war made him a government target as well for having communist associations in his youth. Zillard, who frequently clashed with several officials from the Truman government and even scientists on whether to deploy the bombs, was shunned by the government and the popular media despite his political activism. He lobbied for amendments to the Atomic Energy Act of 1946 that placed nuclear energy under civilian control. In 1947, Zillard wrote an open letter to Stalin in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. In the letter, he urged the world leaders to openly exchange ideas in an effort to mitigate the growing Cold War. In his appeal, he took a balanced view of the peace process, blaming neither the US nor the Soviet Union for the situation. In 1955, he co-signed a letter to the United Nations calling for a ban on nuclear weapons, also signed by Albert Einstein, Edward Teller, and Robert Oppenheimer. He started a series of informal meetings between scientists from East and West to break through the Cold War. Slowly, these small meetings would become big conferences and paved way for several arms control treaties. He started America's first political action committee for arms control and disarmament, the Council for a Livable World. Between October 1959 and 1960, he conducted a series of interactions with Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, culminating in New York with a two-hour interview. During this interview, Zillard proposed the creation of a hotline telephone link between Kremlin and White House so the superpower leaders could communicate quickly in a crisis. It would foster and speed up communication between the Soviet Union and the United States. The hotline was indeed implemented after the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis and remains in use today. There are a few reasons why Zillard is not mentioned among the most indispensable persons in the atom bomb history. This is because very little light has been shed on his contributions by historians, and is largely ignored by the popular media. Zillard's scientific and political exploits have never caught the imagination of the common people because of two reasons. One is his sour relationship with the Manhattan Project director Leslie R. Groves and the Truman government. The other being his own peripatetic way of living and his fleeting time with his Piersall projects.
Zillard was an eccentric, solitary nomad, living most of his life in hotel rooms with two packed suitcases always ready to leave. After leaving Budapest in 1919, he had no true permanent residence. He lived a life of travel, dashing from one project to another, and his associations with various universities were usually tenuous. He was a dedicated, clear, and strong nonconformist. Because he had no long-term institutional affiliations, Zillard had difficulty in marshalling the material forces, such as clerical and laboratory staff, needed to follow through on many of his important ideas. He was essentially a thinker, and he preferred to leave for others the tasks involved in implementing his ideas. He was a natural gadfly, brilliant and utterly lacking in respect for authority. Many of his scientist peers found him abrasive and irritating. This put even his allies like Edward Teller and Arthur Compton, Veneer Bush and James Conant, in a tough place, because while no one could deny Zillard's brilliance or contributions to the bomb project, they also didn't want to spend too much time with him. It is understandable, in retrospect, why Groves had such a dislike towards Zillard. He was a troublemaker, but arguably some of that trouble needed to be made. Zillard had a remarkably nimble and fertile mind. His doctoral dissertation is considered a precursor to modern information theory. He had the first patents of a cyclotron, a linear particle accelerator, the electron microscope, and the very idea of the nuclear chain reaction. Along with Albert Einstein, he also designed an electromagnetic refrigeration engine with no moving parts, which was used in his nuclear reactor. He also holds patents for chemical engineering devices, such as a liquid-liquid extractor. From the 1940s to the 1960s, Zillard took on biophysics. He expected the second half of the 20th century would see the growth of molecular biology. This sentiment drove physicists into biology, including Erwin Schrödinger, Francis Crick, Walter Gilbert, and many more, and the exodus benefited biological science spectacularly. He collaborated with Aaron Novick to develop the chemostat, a device for regulating the growth rate of microorganisms in a bioreactor. They discovered feedback inhibition, an important factor in processes such as growth and metabolism. He published several theories on aging, anti-mutagens, spontaneous mutation of bacteria, devising ways to clone mammalian cells, explaining negative feedback regulation, all of which resulted in numerous articles in the future. Zillard gave essential advice to Theodore Puck and Philip I. Marcus for their first cloning of a human cell in 1955. Zillard is given credit by Nobel laureate Jacques Monod for the negative feedback idea behind his 1965 Nobel Prize. Surprisingly, he even cured his own cancer using a cobalt-60 radiation treatment which he had designed. The Zillard-designed cobalt therapy is still used for treatment of many inoperable cancers. In parallel with his scientific contributions, Zillard maintained an innate understanding of the implications of his findings and how they could impact the course of history. Though his particular combination of skills didn't yield him the acclaim or the Nobel Prize won by many of his peers, or even the Nobel Peace Prize, he would spend his life as a passionate advocate for peace and finding ways science could be used to help humanity without much regard for recognition or fame. Leo Zellert's story is about a scientist making great advances for the quest of pure research, but taking that responsibility upon himself on recognizing that mankind may then proceed to use that knowledge for the purposes of destruction. Even today, his audacious essence of moral responsibility gives us salutary lessons about science, life, and human values.